the reason I wrote the book is, is really pretty simple because uh, the book is about Jesus, uh, the church, family, and sports. And that's my own personal testimony. I grew up in a home that uh, sports were just what we did. Uh, my parents bought a house because it was across the street from baseball fields, a football field, and basketball courts. Uh, so we had access to all three. Um, my bond with my parents uh, was largely through sports, especially my dad. My dad built a pitching mound in the backyard. Uh, I would throw to him every day when he came home. Alabama, I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. The weather was usually good. Uh, and so it's what I did. I was actually pretty good at sports when I was a kid. Um, but my family was not a Christian family, and sports were an idol in my life. Uh, uh, the fact that I was good at uh, them actually, um, you know, uh, caused me to trust in that. And it wasn't until I was playing baseball in college uh, that a friend invited me to church and I heard the gospel and uh, repented and put my faith in Christ. Uh, it was at that point that I began to ask the question, if I'm a Christian, should I even keep doing this? Uh, are there other things that are more important? Uh, are there other things that matter more? Uh, does it, is it just, just a waste of time or can it have something to do with my Christian life? Uh, and so I began asking that question at the very beginning. All I'd ever known was sports. Uh, you know, I'd been in a locker room far more than I'd been in a church. And so I, I kept playing baseball in college. Uh, I didn't have any opportunities to play baseball after college. So I went into coaching. Uh, but making sense out of the relationship between Christianity and sports was very important to me. Around that time, I began sensing a call to ministry. Into, I was a baseball coach and football coach at McAdory High School in Birmingham, Alabama. Ended up resigning and going to Southwestern and getting a Master's of Divinity degree. Uh, and then later, I got a PhD from Southern. Uh, when my kids were born, I started coaching them. Uh, and so it's been about 30 years that I've been thinking about the question, what is the relationship between Christianity and sports? And to be honest with you, a lot of the books that I have read uh, on the subject, I have only found uh, nominally helpful. Uh, some of the books are very academic and um, do not come from the standpoint of uh, a love and passion for sports uh, like I possessed and many others I know possessed. A lot of the other ones are popular books that are really very, very superficial. It's just kind of, you know, play for Jesus and try your best. And uh, so what I'm trying to do in the book is to, uh, to write a book from the standpoint of someone who's first of all, a pastor and a theologian, uh, but one who has always uh, loved and enjoyed sports. And to make it credibly, uh, biblically and theologically, I try to give a biblical theological framework for sports because I think that's what most people skip and, and don't deal with. But I also try to be very practical in the book and to make all kinds of practical application related to coaching, uh, related to playing, and related to parenting kids who are involved in sports. Uh, and so it's the most fun writing project I've ever done in my life. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm involved in various writing projects related to theology or pastoral ministry or preaching, but uh, this was an absolute labor of love. Uh, and so the book is just the fruit of my life. It's, it's me sort of bearing my soul on what God has done in my life and what I think his word says about something that's been very important in my life. The beginning of the book, I do this, and I think it's um, probably as far as a contribution to the discussion standpoint, uh, uh, one of the most significant things about the book. And that is, I, why are there sports? I try to answer that question. Uh, why, if you go uh, to almost any culture, do you find sports and a variety of kinds of sports? Why is it that people do this? Uh, one time I was lecturing in a seminary setting on sports, and I a professor uh, came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this is not necessary for our gospel mission, so why are we wasting our time on it? Why does it matter? Who cares? Uh, and, and so I asked him the question, you know, do you ever read a novel? Do you ever go to a movie that's not distinctively about uh, the Bible? Do you enjoy sunsets on the beach? Do you look at buildings that are made in unbelievable ways and, and, and have a sense of wow? 
right? Uh, it, it, it's, uh, if the answer to those, any of those questions are yes, then he already understands why we're involved in something that is not directly necessary for, for our mission. Uh, the question is, is life just about our utilitarian obedience to specifically Christian tasks? Uh, my answer to that question is emphatically no. Uh, I think that sports are not necessary, but they are an inevitable response to the world that God made. In other words, uh, God created the world and he to told man and woman to take dominion over the world for his glory. And uh, as, as humanity responded to the world God had made, there are certain things that aren't necessarily fundamentally necessary for existence, uh, but are inevitable consequences of responding to the God who made the world. Those things are like singing. Song is not necessary for our existence. Song is not absolutely necessary for our gospel mission. And yet song is inevitable because in the glory of the created order, as God has revealed himself, there is a welling up inside his image bearers that wants to sing. And the same is true uh, when you think about the dominion mandate of uh, ruling the world under the authority of God. Uh, what do you have to do? Uh, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, you are to function in the world for the sake of human flourishing. And that means that in the world that God made, as, as more and more people come, they're going to need to be buildings to store food. Uh, they're going to need to be bridges built over water. They're going to be all kinds of things that have to happen for us to promote human flourishing in the world. Some of those things are necessary and utilitarian. But the way God has made us, it's also going to involve unnecessary things as well. So sports is really just one aspect of culture making. Uh, God is the only one who can create out of nothing. Uh, so God didn't make sports in a specific sense, but God made a world that made sports inevitable. That's the way people respond to him. And so uh, obeying God in the dominion mandate means utilitarian actions like storing food, but it also means non-utilitarian actions like singing, uh, like uh, um, uh, something like uh, sports, something like making things. So when a building is made, it's not made just uh, the most bare essential way that it can be made. It's designed to be aesthetically pleasing. It's designed to be uh, have some measure of of identity to it based on the people who made it and what they're saying about God when they made it. Well, that's what sports is. Sports is an aspect of culture making. It's what we make out of the world God has made. Uh, and that explains why, for instance, there are different sports in different parts of the world and why different areas and communities love different sports. Uh, you see the same thing musically. Uh, if you go to the New Orleans area, and I would say, what is the predominant type of music? You would say jazz. If I say Nashville, you're going to say country. If I say California, you've got sort of a beach uh, music movement there. Why? Because as people respond to the world God had made, there's different, there's varying ways based on their cultural context in which they reflect back to God, whether they know they're doing that or not. The same is true with sports. And, and so sports exist because of the world God had made, God has made and the way people respond to it. Now, one other aspect of sports that I think is very important for us to understand, and that, that, that makes them inevitable, is that uh, when God gave the dominion mandate to rule the world under his authority, human beings were at that point given the responsibility to hone their skills to be able to do that well. Uh, and so for us to promote human flourishing in the world in all kinds of ways, our minds need to be keen, our bodies need to be strong. Uh, we need to hone our physical skills the best we can so we can do that. Well, one of the ways we do that in a non-utilitarian way is through uh, sports and athletics. As we compete with one another, what we see is the human body uh, being honed in a way that it can accomplish things. And that helps the person who is competing, uh, not just while they're competing, but it helps them in other aspects of their life, all kinds of ways. So if you have a guy who plays football and he lifts a lot of weights and he's gotten really strong, 
and there's work that needs to be done in the community and you need somebody to lift things and carry them somewhere, he's a great person to do it. There may be an elderly lady who can't do that, but the fact that this guy's honed his physical skills, he serves the community by carrying things and doing things for other people. And so sports have a relationship of us holding, our, holding one another accountable to hone our physical skills to the glory of God. Now that's true whether we recognize that we're doing this inevitably to the glory of God or not. Now Christians should specifically tie what they are doing to God in honoring and glorifying him but it is a reality nonetheless. And so that's where I play sports. I think that sports are a competitive manifestation of the performing arts. So sports are capable through the uh, disciplining of our bodies, through the learning of skills to reveal truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, in the same way that uh, music is, in the same way that dance is, in the same way that art is, and yet sports are a uniquely competitive manifestation of that. Uh, and so the competition helps produce the sense of excellence. Uh, and so uh, that's sort of an overview. So I would say that sports are a gift of God. They are a response to the world, an inevitable response to the world God has made. They are a manifestation of culture, what we make out of the world that God has made. They're a comp competitive manifestation of the performing arts capable of displaying truth, beauty, and goodness. That's why sometimes in watching sports you go, wow, in the same way you do at other aspects of the performing arts. They're an opportunity to worship because God is the one who's created these image bearers. They're reflecting something about him in the feats that we are doing. They're a testing ground that exposes our character that if we want to form it in a way that honors God, we can use sports to do that. They're an opportunity for witness because in cultures, believers and unbelievers both have an interest and appreciation in sports. They are helpful in the world that God has made, but never ultimate. And sports are a way that we can glorify and honor God and serve him, but they're never a source of our personal identity. So whether someone excels in sports or doesn't excel in sports should not change one's uh, contentment or satisfaction in God, because it's like Teddy Roosevelt said, who was uh, the president uh, who loved sports, that sports are a mighty good servant, but like many other mighty good servants, they are a mighty bad master. So sports treated as ultimate can become an idolatrous competitor to God. That's sort of the lightning quick overview of the way I biblically and theologically place sports that all of the other conclusions I draw about sports are rooted in that reality. I try to be very clear about is that sports are a non-essential but inevitable response to the world God has made. So all cultures uh, participate in sports that you can find in, in, in almost all cultures that you can find in the history of the world. And then you have to answer the question, why? And so sports are not necessary. Uh, uh, the reason why we can defend sports uh, is because we should not suppress the ways in which we have opportunities to glorify God. Uh, our goal is not a reductionistic attempt to minimize the number of ways God is honored and glorified, but rather the exact opposite. It's to maximize it. So our faith and our commitment to the glory of God extends beyond our church worship services extends beyond our direct actions of sharing the gospel into the sense in which we are to say, wow, about the world that God has made. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I tied it to like song. Song is not necessary. Uh, you don't have to have song to live. You don't have to have song to share the gospel. You don't have to have song to worship. Uh, what you have to have is the gospel message. But inevitably, we sing. And if we were to suppress song, uh, we would be doing something that actually detracts from the glory of God. And, and so when we think about sporting competition and the delight that people pervasively have in it across cultural landscapes, uh, there is no reason to suggest that we should suppress that 
but rather we are involved in redeeming it for the glory of God. Uh, the, this is an important issue in the theology of culture in general. Uh, when uh, far too often in uh, what we might call the fundamentalist movement, uh, the idea was to uh, shrink down the number of things we're involved in and to shrink the world so we can focus on the things that really matter. But biblically, what really matters is all of life. <laughs> Uh, 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 a gospel that doesn't meet you in the dailiness and the routine is less than the biblical gospel. So important events in the Bible happen when people are walking to a well. So Paul keeps latching on to these sports metaphors because they're so pervasive uh, in the cultural context. And I would argue that um, the, the context in which Paul writes is more sports obsessed than ours is. Uh, people act as though we're more sports obsessed than any time in the history of the world. Uh, I don't think that uh, is true. Uh, Charles Simeon, uh, uh, a pastor of another era, said there are two, but two lessons for every Christian to learn. The one is to enjoy God in everything, and the other is to enjoy everything in God. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. And sports uh, is something that arises in every culture. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how can we enjoy sports to the glory of God? Uh, so you, we've got to answer the question to answer your question is, are we attempting to honor God in the world by only doing the things that are utilitarian and absolutely necessary? Is that the path to sanctification and obedience? Or are we doing the exact opposite? We're doing the things that are necessary and vital and then we're allowing those to shape how we see everything. And so when Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, he is not suggesting the only thing he ever thinks about directly is the cross. He is suggesting that through the lens which he sees the world, it always contains the cross. And so when we're dealing with issues like this, uh, this there, there is no biblical warrant for people to suppress their love of sports. Rather, the biblical witness would seem to do the exact opposite, like Paul does, when in Paul's day, it's tied directly to idolatry. Uh, we can say that it's civil religion in a lot of cultures today and idolatrous, but in Paul's day, it's directly tied to idolatry and certain pagan gods. But Paul does not think that that makes it an unhelpful metaphor for the Christian. In fact, he latches onto it and keeps talking about it. But, but being intentional, know the biblical witness about sports, know the way it's positioned biblically, uh, talk to people about the things they have a point of contact with, live it out yourself. Uh, for instance, I always give people a hard time because as soon as the coach of your favorite college team uh, doesn't win a game, you want them to win, what does everybody do? They call for them to be fired, right? Uh, and so... I always say, you know, how hard do you think that coach is working? He's probably got a cot at the office. He's probably working 70 hours a week. He's probably doing this. Or the, well, the Georgia shirt there. Mark Rick got fired. Les Miles got fired. I mean, their records are amazing. Uh, and and, and uh, I'll say something like this. You know, you want him to work even harder. You want him to be committed to even more excellence. Uh, does that inspire you to do the same thing at your job? And well, you know what they usually tell me? Well, I don't make the kind of money he does. And I say, well, oh, oh, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you worked for the glory of God. I thought you weren't driven by materialism and money. I, I thought that you thought your life was as significant as anybody else's, no matter how much money you make. So if, you, if you're looking at your local college coach, uh, doesn't inspire you to greater excellence uh, in what you do, there's a problem. Uh, you're not thinking about it intentionally as a Christian. Uh, I would say to you that I've learned from Nick Saban and Urban Meyer particularly, so many things that I use in pastoral ministry all the time. Two years ago, the banner that we hung over our church for that year was be where your feet are. Uh, that's a phrase Saban uses with the Alabama football team all the, all the time. So, so we want to say, be where your feet are. Be intentionally where you are, fully committed for Jesus, wherever that is. You are your strategic ministry opportunity. 
You are, your life is your unique opportunity to glorify God. Don't wait, be waiting till you get somewhere one day. Be where your feet are for Christ today. Well, you know, that's, that's a link I'm drawing between my interest in Alabama and my interest in pastoral ministry. Uh, I make all my staff watch a coaching video that Urban Meyer did because some of the concepts he uses in there are fascinating and are, are easily leveraged for a uh, Christian ministry. Um, you know, so, so my main thing to you is today is to say, be intentional. Do not be a passive engager with sports. Be an intentional, uh, one who intentionally engages with sports. So you don't want to be dismissive of sports on one hand, but you don't want to uncritically absorb sports on the other hand. We are involved in being a part of the redemption of it in our lives to the glory of Christ. What we do is engage with sports. Uh, that is stepping in and helping leagues. Uh, we've put on uh, camps before because, you know, I used to be a high school coach. I played baseball in college. Uh, I used to do camps myself all over. Um, and, and so we, we've done that. Um, I, I would say that in our approach, uh, we want our people uh, to play in the local city leagues uh, rather than creating uh, sort of alternative leagues. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of uh, where you are and a matter of your own strategy. And so our strategy is to empower uh, our people to be Christians in uh, the city and local leagues. We want to uh, uh, have, have people as witnesses there. For, for instance, on Wednesday night, um, we have stuff at our church. But if, uh, if I know your kid's playing a ball game and you're there, I'm coming up to you asking you, why are you there? We need Christians in the stands at that ball game. We need you being a Christian at the park. Uh, and so that's our approach to it. Um, now we've, we've toyed with some different things. We've got a lot of land, so we could build a lot of fields and, and do some things, but that's what we've done, uh, thus far is, uh, to take the approach of using our time, energy, and resources to serve in the existing leagues and to self consciously equip our parents to do that. Now uh, you think about it. When's the last time at a church you've heard? Uh, there's a there's going to be a special Bible study on uh, using um, your uh, sports involvement with your children uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, not very often. Well, we try to do that. Uh, first of all, let me just start out by saying that uh, like like football gets a lot of media attention today. Uh, I think that football is as we normally reckon safety a safe sport. First of all, 97% of the people who play football don't play in the NFL in college. <laughs> uh, they play in, in rec leagues. Uh, if you've ever watched uh, little kids playing football, it's more like human bumper cars uh, than any sort of violent uh, hits and stuff. And so, uh, you know, one thing people do is they take the CTE issue uh, and they project it down and act like all football is under the same uh, dangerous shadow. Well. That's absurd. Uh, first of all, there was, a, there was a, a study that came out that said long distance running for competitive long distance runners caused heart problems. Well, if you use that data to say that kids in fifth grade ought not be long distance running because it could cause heart problems, that would ignore the fact that the problem with fifth grade kids is obesity <laughs> and the fact that they're not running at, at, at major competitive levels. So I think football is safe as we normally reckon safety. Um, and and I, I think that's true at all levels, even the NFL. Uh, and I don't know, I can talk more about that. Uh, most people who play NFL football are better off uh, than if they didn't physically over the long haul. Um, but, but I do think the NFL has a responsibility to be honest and forthright with all the data and they have not been. Uh, and so that's a problem. But, but back to your, I, I talk about football because that's the one everybody likes to talk about. But, but it is a, a legitimate question that we need to struggle with um, to say, are all sports acceptable? Uh, and my answer to that is no. Uh, and the, the, where I like to draw the line or try to draw the line is that 
if the purpose of a sport is to harm your opponent, uh, I don't think it's acceptable. Um, now, you know, there used to be traveling through town, the baddest man in town competitions, where they just throw up a kind of a cage and people go and fight one another. I don't think that's acceptable because the purpose is to harm your opponent uh, because nobody wins until there's a knockout. Right? Now, now I do think boxing is acceptable, uh, but I do think that boxing has to be regulated. Uh, for instance, uh, they went from 16 rounds to 12 rounds uh, for boxing matches, which has been a good thing because all of the data suggested uh, that the head trauma issues were related to the late rounds. Uh, but boxing, you can win a boxing match in all kinds of ways. In, in fact, Floyd Mayweather is probably the greatest pound for pound boxer of this generation. And people tend to, after Floyd Mayweather fights, say they're boring. And the reason they say they're boring is he does he has no interest in knocking out his opponent. He just wants to win the fight. And he's absolutely quick. And so he just moves and jabs and doesn't take a lot of shots himself. And uh, so you can win a boxing match with finesse. Uh, you can win a wrestling match with technique. Uh, I think where the line gets a little bit more blurry is uh, something like MMA. Um, and uh, th that's where the line starts to blur. Um, uh, so so uh, you, you, the point of the sport cannot be to harm your opponent, which that's not the point of any of the major sports, hockey, football, uh, baseball, basketball. I've been honored to be with you. And anytime, uh, Dr. Huffman, I can help you out, uh, I'll do it. I hope you guys will check the book out. And if you've got any questions uh, beyond this class, you feel free to email me and I'd love to help you in any way that I can.